We've already started. And Dai is back. Dai, did you get him set up? I'm really close. Okay. So in the meantime, I can talk about temperature of the wine, serving temperature. So we asked you in the instructions, and then when we, when we uh, dropped off your wines to your car, we asked you to put it in the fridge, the wines in the fridge, and then about a half an hour before the tasting, take the wines and the bourbon out. And some people get appalled at the fact that we tell them to chill their reds. Um, but what I tell people all the time is, when they made the rule, room temperature for red wines, the castles in Europe 200 years ago, or whatever, were damp and chilly. And so your wines were nice and chilled. You know, their idea of room temperature back then was 60 to, uh, to 65 degrees. Ours is 70 to 75 degrees. So it's a perfect way to chill it down a little bit. If you are drinking warm red wine, the alcohol really hits you first and you really want the, the fruit to hit you, not that alcohol. Um, white, they suggest, and Diana always says, who are they? Um, so, <laughs> but they're my experts. Um, they say to do it between 50 and 55 degrees. A lot of times you take it right out of the fridge and wines are, the whites are just too chilled. They, the cold will mask the flavors and aromas. So you want to take those out of the fridge and let them warm up just a little bit to your liking. Um, and then sparkling wine, you want to chill down to about 45 degrees. You do want it nice and chilled. It keeps those bubbles flowing when you, when you chill it down and nice and crisp. Um, I was just going to talk very briefly about the cheeses. Your cheese is either from Milton, which is in Iowa, or Marcoux, which is not too far over in, in Illinois. Um, and we talked about using something uh, crisp to cut something creamy. Um, but it's also sometimes you want to pair the weight of things. So you can have a Chardonnay that has a little more body, maybe a little oak to it, and then try it with one of those cheeses. So that's an example of kind of pairing the same body or weight of a food and a wine together. That's all I have to say about that. Good. I think time-wise we're running on right on track. So why don't we go ahead? Good. I'll move on to the next wine, which is a dry rosé, your full and V. And it is from an area called Odd uh, Francis on the Mediterranean coast, but way down by the Spanish border. Oh, price of the guy. Sorry to interrupt. It's 1599. Chardonnay is 1399. And the rosé is 1299 as well. So rosés have just grown in popularity so much in the past five years. I bet five years ago we'd be at a tasting and I would go to pour a taste of dry rosé and people would stop I don't like sweet wine and I say oh it's not sweet it looks pink it's scary looking I agree <laughs> but it is not sweet at all some of us grew up on white Zinfandel yeah I won't tell you when I started drinking that oh we thought we were cool we'd have our collars up and yeah yeah I had big hair yeah um so the make the way you make wine real quick is if, if it's white grapes, you take your grapes, you crush the, the, the grapes, the juice falls into the tank, and you take the skins and throw them out. To make red wine, you crush the grapes, put the juice down in the tank, and you throw the, the skins down in the tank, and the skins give the wine color. There's really only one red grape in the world, Alicante Boucher. It has red pulp. All the other red grapes are white grapes with red skin, and the skins soak the wine and give it color. So with a rosé, all they do is put the skins down for a short while and they get to a blush color and then they take the skins off and they allow the wine to filter or to ferment, I'm sorry, all the way dry. White Zin, they would take the skins off and then bottle the juice right there and it would have all that sugar left in it. So um, they are just wonderful. When you're talking about um, you know, barbecuing in the summer and you're gonna make a, you're gonna grill a big steak or a hamburger and you think I'm gonna have a really nice big Cabernet with that. And you open it up and it's just not refreshing. I mean, it's, it's, 
it's not nearly as refreshing as opening a white. But if you like red wine, you can go to a rosé. And it's got just that little tinge of red flavor, but it's, but it's cold and refreshing. It's a perfect summer wine. It's really become a, more of a year-round wine for more and more of our customers. And especially at Thanksgiving, it's a great wine to have on your, on your table. It's a great food wine, goes with all kinds of different foods. And your ham and your turkey aren't big, heavy meats. So it's, it's just a, a great wine. And when you drink it, just think strawberries. It just, it's, um, it's just really light and refreshing. If you, if you go to France someday, sorry, Dean. Uh, if, you go to, if you go to France um, and you're sitting outside on a cafe and you look around, everyone, they say, will be drinking rosé. So as we said, this is the Fallen V. It's got a bright blue cap and a bright blue label, so it's easy to recognize. Yeah, and so you have not seen it because all, all of yours have screw caps on them. Um, but we have seen three different enclosures for these wines so far. The first had a real cork, the Gavi to Gavi, had a real cork, the second had a screw cap, and the third, the Fallen V, had a synthetic cork. And, you know, cork is just um, the bark of a tree, mainly in Spain and Portugal, and they let the bark grow for 10 years and then they strip it, they make it into corks. Well, when wine got so popular in the late 90s, they were having to strip it much more quickly. Seven years they were going for it to see how that worked. And things started going wrong. You know, the, the corks were manufactured incorrectly, they can get tainted. And, it, and it, you say, a taint, what is that? Um, if you've ever had a corked bottle of wine, they call it a corked bottle of wine, um, it smells musty and moldy like wet cardboard in your basement. And so people started, you know, if, if you buy a bottle of wine and it's corked, if you buy it from us, bring it back. We turn it back into a distributor, we'll give you a new one. And they turn it into the, to the winery. The winery takes the hit. And in any other industry, they say, they, they, they say that two to 6% of all wines that are in bottles with a cork in it could start, have, have started to go bad already. And you may not notice it. And may, I may tout this wine for your anniversary dinner as being so great. And you take it home and it may just have been starting to go bad, which would be a really bummer. Um, but if, you, if the winery keeps taking the hit on it, they got to do something. And, then, and no other industry is a two to six percent air rate acceptable. But with the pop of the cork and all that, it lingered for a long time. Now everyone's embracing these, these screw caps and these synthetic corks. We, we, we do a lot of corporate accounts during the uh, holidays. We have customers that send clients gifts. Five years ago, they wouldn't even consider a screw cap on a bottle of wine. Now we do it all the time. People gravitate now towards the screw, the screw cap because they're so easy to open. And you have much less chance of having a musty smelling bottle of wine. So that's it. And then do I turn it over to Betsy now? Yes, Betsy, back to you. Perfect, thank you. And there's some questions in the chat for you guys, but we can, just so you know. So we're going to show you um, a very short three, I think three minute video. Um, and then uh, one of our special guests will tell her story about Home Sweet Home. So give me one minute while I start this up and hope we're gonna hope that it works. Okay. Turn it off for one second. I'm going to start it over. Okay. Home 
Home Sweet Home is a furniture bank that provides furniture and household items to families in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. We help people turn their brand new apartment or their house into a home. Well, I would describe Home Sweet Home as a, as a, as somewhat of a sanctuary. You know, it's a place where you can come and you can be, you know, changed from being hopeless to having some hope. Many of our clients have come from difficult situations and they have housing, but this allows them to have a comfortable bed to sleep on a night. It, it allows them to have a plate and silverware to eat off of. Many of our clients are just starting new jobs and um, if you get a good night's sleep, it's really a lot easier to care for your kids well and do a good job at work and uh, return to contributing to the community. So when you, when you walk into your house at night after working for a hard day, you have a couch to crash on, right? You have some place where you feel safe and comfortable. Um, if you have children, you have a place for your kids to like run into their room and jump on the bed and a place to congregate for you know family dinners at nighttime and to be able to give that piece back to our clients is very meaningful. We hear so many incredible comments from our clients, but one of the things that I think makes them happiest is that sometimes for years these people haven't had choices. And to have the simple choice of saying, I like this set of sheets and I don't like this set of sheets, I think really um, can help restore some dignity that they may not have felt for a while. People can get involved in three main ways. They can volunteer. Um, we always need personal shoppers, people to help deliver furniture um, and help in our warehouse. People can also donate money. It takes a lot of resources to make this important mission happen. Um, and we always need donations of furniture and household items. So everything has been donated um, and it comes from individuals in the community who care. So we always need more items to make that possible. When somebody decides to donate money to Home Sweet Home, it helps us in so many ways that not everybody gets to see. We have to put gas in the truck to be able to deliver to the families. We have overheads with our beautiful warehouse to be able to allow families to come in and shop and see what kind of furniture is actually going to their home. Those donations are extremely vital to Home Sweet Home, much in the same way that a furniture donation would be. You know, and sometimes people need just a little trickle of hope and give them the attitude, a positive attitude to go to greater heights. So I think the picture of is that when a person comes here and they get to make the choice and they see the results, they get the feeling and the dignity that, hey, I can do bigger and better things. You know, it's a stepping stone for them to be successful in their life. And if you ever get a chance to talk to the clients and see the gratitude in their faces, can only feel like that warmth and love coming from them. Yours, Diana. So I get to wear two hats tonight uh, because I own Grapevine and I've also volunteered at Home Sweet Home for about four and a half years. And I'm gonna tell you about two of my favorite things about Home Sweet Home. And the first one is um, my favorite moment with each client. So as you're hearing, our clients come in and they get to shop for their items normally. And um, we always start them in the kitchen. And in all honesty, some of our single men aren't all that into the kitchen. They really don't care about the pattern on the plate or how many cookie sheets they need or about their Tupperware, but they make their choices. And then we ask them to choose a kitchen table. And again, they're, they're, they're interested and they're choosing that kitchen table. But at this point, we see them really looking over at all the stuffed furniture. They're really distracted. So we take them over and ask them to pick out a couch first because we want everything to match for them. They pick out their couch and then they get to what they really want, a recliner. So they sit in a couple and they're okay, but then they find the right one and they sit in it and they lean back and close their eyes and a huge smile comes across their face. 
every client seems to have that moment. And sometimes it's a recliner. Sometimes it really is the perfect pattern on their dishes or a piece of art that speaks to them or the perfect comforter for their kid's bed where they can see their kid jumping on the bed. But I love that moment when the light bulb goes off and they see how their apartment really can be a place of comfort and respite for them when it's really their home sweet home. The other thing I want to talk about is how your donations have impacted Home Sweet Home. So about four and a half years ago, or four years ago, I guess, <laughs> um, Betsy and I were loading up a truck with another woman. Now, at this point, it really was Betsy and a bunch of volunteers pulling off a lot of this. And to my memory, although I could be incorrect, we didn't have a, any paid <laughs> staff. Am I right? No paid staff. Okay, so some people say I'm prone to exaggerating and making things up, but I am 100% positive this was the hottest day on record ever in St. Louis. And we're loading a truck, and it's the first time I ever saw Betsy take a twin mattress and whip it on top of her head and walk up the ramp into the truck by herself. It was pretty impressive. So we have the truck about two thirds of the way loaded and we're just, again, dripping in sweat when Betsy gets a call that the client couldn't take their furniture the next day, which meant we had to unload the truck. <laughs> now, as I remember, Betsy was completely calm and I wanted to throw a tantrum like a two-year-old on the bottom of the truck, but pulled myself together and I said, you know, Betsy, in 10 years, when we actually have paid staff that help us do all the heavy work. This will be a funny story. So now it's only four years later. <laughs> and because of the generosity of our donors, we have a beautiful warehouse. We have four trucks and we have the most incredible staff that make everything run smoothly, do a lot of the heavy work and uh, have allowed us to help more than 1800 families make their house a home sweet home. So a few of the things I love. Uh, now, we, we had a question. So. A lot of people like my t-shirt. Oh yeah. yeah. A lot of people want to know where to get the home sweet home t-shirt. That is a vintage t-shirt actually. That's one of the first ones that were made, I believe, the beautiful blue. Yeah. So Terry and Connie asked, how did, we just, how did we select the wines for tonight? And really what, what we wanted to do is give a variety of styles, a light, crisp white, a heavier white in Chardonnay, um, and then the rosé, of course, because they're so popular, and they're kind of that bridge in between white and red. And, um, and then we selected a lighter style red and a heavier, bolder red at the end, which we'll get to. Um, but that's, that's why we did it. The price points, we like to keep in a good price range. Uh, we'll talk later about purchases uh, this evening and tomorrow. 10% will go back to Home Sweet Home. So we like to price the wines in, an, in a price range where people are comfortable, I would say. If we did all really expensive wines, nobody would buy. So, okay. So I think we're ready for our first red wine. I am there. So our first is called Cuvée Jean Paul. I bottled it. Uh -oh. well, yours didn't. Uh, that would be interesting to know whether the bottle yeah. leaked at all for people. Um, so Cuvée Jean Paul is from an area called Recluse in France. It is in the south e uh, eastern corner below the Rhone region. In the Rhone region, which is north of it, um, Grenache and Syrah are the predominant grapes. That's, those are the two grapes in this wine as well. Grenache is a soft, easy drinking grape. It's a little bit heavier, I would say, than maybe Pinot Noir, but just more spice, more flavor, really um, you get soft, 
strawberry, raspberry flavors. And then Syrah is a more medium body wine. And it's a little bit bolder. You get a little more plum. You can get some raspberry, you can get some blueberry flavors as well. But it's a little bit heavier than Grenache, but it blends so well. You know, the, the great regions of the Rhone region, um, you know, Gingandas and, and Cote de Rhone, those are the same grapes that go into this. And this little guy is $10.99 a bottle, and it's just uh, a great little wine for um, all kinds of occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you are now talking. Yeah. I think I'm done. Is that it? Yep. So uh, hopefully you've been eating all the foods all along, but now we're going to get into some of the fuller bodied uh, wines, which will, I think, go really nicely with the cured meat that you have. So the smokiness in those meats often uh, pairs really well with wines that see a little bit of a barrel age. Most barrels are charred a little bit on the inside, give it a little bit of smokiness, and it can work well with uh, these kind of smoked meats. We also have these fun little pots of jam, and this is a fig jam. You can put that fig jam on your cheese or on a cracker or on the meat, and um, I think it really helps highlight both the food and the wine to bring those both out together. What are people thinking about these wines? What's your favorite one so far? Chat us back. Marjorie wants to know if it helps to cry in the wine. <laughs> helps to cry in the yeah, wine? Yeah, from the video. Uh, I got, the, story. I got the short stick because I had to talk after the video that makes me cry every time. I'm like, that's not fair. That's why I went away. <laughs> All right. Is there another topic we can measure? Temperature. Yeah. Um, vintage. Oh, vintage. Yeah, vintage is a really important thing. Um, the, the biggest factor on vintage is the weather. I mean, the weather dictates everything as to how good a vintage is. And what you want in a vintage, in a growing season, I should say, is a long, warm, dry growing season. Not a lot of rain, not a lot of heat, um, it, and you just want a long, consistent theme going. And you can have that going all summer long, and at the last minute, right at the end before harvest, it can look like it's gonna rain. So winemakers and vineyard managers have to get out there, and they've gotta decide, are we gonna pick before it rains, or are we gonna pick after it rains and hope things dry up? Because if you have that warm, long, dry growing season, your grapes are nice and small and concentrated with flavor. Just tiny little grapes. And once, and they are thirsty. And if it starts raining, they're just going to soak up all that water and become big, watery, bloated grapes and really ruin everything. So it is Mother Nature. They're always dealing with that. Um, the, the nice thing about a, a smaller wine shop in St. Louis is that we taste I would say we taste 95 to 99 percent of the wines that we get into the shop. It's and a if, it's a really tough job. Yeah, We're looking yeah, out yeah. for you. <laughs> we taste a lot of wine. We reject a lot of wine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The real expensive ones, the, the reps don't always open. But from one vintage to the next, it can be a totally different wine. And if we order more of a wine that we've run out of, and we see that the vintage has changed, we will call our rep and ask them to come and taste us on the wine or else we'll send it back. And we, won't, we just won't sell it to you without knowing what it's gonna taste like. And that's what a little wine shop brings to the table. You know, the, the larger grocery stores, the, the big box stores, they are authorized by their higher reps to bring in different wines um, from vintage to vintage to vintage. And it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, they are authorized to carry that label. Um, we can sell 100 cases of a wine and if we don't like the next vintage, we will, we will, we just won't buy anything. Our reps say, oh, just put it on the shelf that people know the name. And that's not what we want to do. We want to wow you and get you to come back to us. Um, 
tell your funny story about uh, 20 bench. So yeah. we had a uh, Cabernet years ago, it's no longer available, but um, $16.99, we sold 200 cases of this wine. It was fantastic. And a young guy came in and said, hey, do you have 20 bench? And, and I said, no, we just didn't like the next vintage. And um, so we're not going to carry it. Anymore. And I said, but we have this wine, and we have this wine, and we have this wine, all in the same price range. He's like, no, that's okay. See you, thanks. And he walked out, which is atypical for our customers. They typically like to know what we like now. And um, so luckily I was working about two weeks later and the, the, I would say kid, he was you know, a lot younger than I am. Um, he came back in and uh, he said, what do you have between 15 and $20 on a Cabernet? And I said, well, we have this and this and this, same wines probably. And he said, oh, I just want to let you know, by the way, your competitor, they do have the new vintage and it's rotten, it's bad. And I said, see, so now he goes, I know, I know. I said, now you'll trust me. So that's what we try to bring to our customers. Um, so um, I haven't done a complete count, but I think most of all people have liked the Gabi. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and then uh, the Jean Paul. Um, and I'm glad people really like that wine and chocolate pairing, that people have talked about that, because I think it's so unique and fun. Um, and that was a little intimidating to do because we have an amazing chocolatier who is watching with us tonight. So our neighbor and friend has Bittersweet Kitchens, which is a line of chocolate sauces that we've carried here that are outstanding. So uh, I'll have to get the lowdown on from uh, Audrey, see what she thinks. Yeah. Okay. Then under the Petite Syrah? Petite Syrah. Oh, I'm sorry, somebody else asked what your favorite region is. So I have to admit, I am just a sucker for bubbles. So I think every party should start with champagne. I just love anything with bubbles. So if I had to pick a favorite region, it would be the Champagne region of France, where sparkling wine that is champagne comes from. But Mike just drinks that to humor me. He'll, he'll drink it, but yeah. he's not. I good. like it. But, but I love it. What's your favorite my region? My favorite. That's so tough. I would uh -huh. probably say, um, I can't afford to drink them every night, but probably Chateau de Tapas oh, in France, yeah. which is a, the big, big, big brother to the Jean Paul. Um, and it's really great. But I love Syrah. You know, Syrahs are kind of dead um, in the water, but they're trying to make a comeback. But, um, California Syrah can be, especially Washington Syrah can be such a great value and so powerful and flavorful. So, Shannon Ridge. Shannon Ridge, our next wine, it is um, a Petite Syrah. And it's from Lake County, which is north of Napa. And it is a bold and big, spicy wine. And you get lots of blueberry and plum and black pepper. And Petit Syrah is really becoming more and more popular. Thank you. Um, but despite that, it's relatively a rare grape. They say there's only about 10,000 acres of Petit, Petit Syrah planted throughout the world, 80% of which is here in California and 15% in Australia. So there's like 5% throughout the rest of the world and very little of it is planted in France where the grape originated. So um, it, is, it is deep and it, getting off subject here real quick. If you like lamb or a big beef steak of some sort, it is just a beautiful way to go. Um, it is one of our favorite wines. We went, was it February, in February, right before all this started. Um, Okay, let me back up. Two years ago, we had Brenda, the national sales rep, was here at the shop. And she's telling us about the wines. And she's telling us about how they prune their vines. So when the grapes are growing out in the field, you've got the grape bunch and the foliage, the leaves start growing over, the, over them. And you need to cut back that foliage in order to allow the sun to beat down and ripen the fruit. But if you're pruning and you hit the grape bunch with your hand, you're gonna bruise those grapes and they're gonna be lost. So what they have out there, she was telling me, 
is sheep that go around from vineyard to vineyard and they munch on the leaves, but they don't eat the fruit at all. And they need herding dogs to herd them from one vineyard to the next every day. And because they're up in Lake County, which it's a little more wild, they say, they, those animals, the dogs and the sheep need protection. So they have um, Great Pyrenees, big white looking St. Bernard type dogs that live out in the fields with the sheep to protect them. And I said, protect them from what? Coyotes? And they, she said, oh yeah, coyotes and mountain lion and bear. And these dogs will chase these guys away. Um, but it was, she said, you need to come out and see it for yourself. And we, we have Louie and we love dogs. So we went out with a, 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 another couple uh, friends of ours in February and Brenda met us at the, at the bottom of the mountain, basically drove us up to the cabin. When we got inside, they had a, a pot of lamb stew waiting for us and all these different wines. She did a quick tasting with us. And the next morning, Brenda Shannon, her, her uh, husband and, and she owned the winery clay and, and she owned the winery. Uh, Angie, what did Angie. I say, Brenda? Angie. Angie. Angie Shannon. Angie picked us up and we all piled into her truck and in the middle of us was their dog Lad, their herding dog Lad, and we're driving around looking at the beautiful sights off the top of the mountain and there's fog in the morning and, and uh, we see this flock of sheep. And so we all hop out and, and Angie says, bring them home Lad, and the dog just takes off at a sprint, starts circling around to the back of them and starts herding them towards us. And right over the ridge comes this big flock of sheep. It was just the best. And, uh, and we saw some of the Pyrenees. One of the guys wouldn't come near us because they say the only time he gets near a car is to go to the vet and he, had, he hates that. So he kept backing off from us as we uh, tried, to talk, tried to get close to him. But it is, you know, it's $12.99. We sell their Cabernet as well for $12.99. Sell a ton of both wines. And they have a Sauvignon Blanc at $17.99 that is absolutely beautiful as well. One of our favorite wineries right now. Yeah, it was really a fun visit. If you haven't tried the fig jam, this would, or if you have and you have some left, this would be fun to taste with the um, Petite Syrah because it does have that dense fruity flavor. And I think they uh, really work well together also. So you could try the little bit of jam with a little bit of that petite syrup. And if you and if you're looking for a really nice bottle in the, like the $50 range, they make another label called Ovis, which is a Cabernet Franc. The mm -hmm. Cabernet Francs you need to be a little careful with because some of the time they can be really green and vegetal. Um, it needs to have a lot of sun. Um, but this Ovis Cabernet Franc is just big and beautiful and kind of gamey, kind of meaty, kind of earthy like Cab Franc is, but just dark and dense. And really, really a great watch. All right, Betsy. Yep. Back to you. Hey. All right. So um, I just wanted to point out, I'm kind of like Lady Gaga tonight. So if you know Lady Gaga, she like changes outfits like every, like in the middle of a song, right? So in my background, um, I've been changing pictures. Um, for those who haven't ever been to our warehouse or been able to come volunteer, um, this is actually somebody, some client's um, apartment after they got it set up and sent us a picture. Um, I think the last one was in the warehouse and I'll switch it again in, in a minute, but um, kind of trying to give you just a slight glimpse of, of our warehouse. Uh, next we have on to talk to you just very briefly, uh, a good friend of mine, Rachel, but also happens to be the very first recurring donor that we have. Um, so, Rach, you're going to have to unmute yourself. All right. Hello, oh, Betsy. Hi. Hello, everyone. How's it going? So good to see some familiar faces and so many new faces. Is everyone enjoying the wine tonight? Yeah, it's wonderful. Thanks so much again, Mike and Diana, for hosting this wonderful evening. Um, so, as Betsy said, my name is Rachel Rimmerman. Um, thanks again for having me here tonight, Betsy. I'm very excited to talk to you all. Um, I actually used to work for Betsy way back in the day. 
Um, <laughs> I'll stick around later for some stories. But um, <laughs> I knew her when Home Sweet Home was just a twinkle of an idea in her eye. And I have to say, watching it grow from Betsy's brain into the amazing organization full of wonderful staff and volunteers and clients, partners that it is today has just been such a wonderful experience and a moving honor and um, so excited to have been able to be a part of it. So um, I'm also part of a home sweet home family. Cheers to any families here who are who have roped in all their family members. Um, so uh, my sister's been on the board, my brother-in-law's volunteered, my mom collects all kinds of home furnishings all the way from Kansas and drives them across the state. So I know there's several folks on here who have uh, um, done all of those things as well. And so um, just want to give a quick shout out to the families. Um, when I think of Home Sweet Home, just to kind of frame why I'm a recurring donor, um, I actually think of a move that I helped with several years ago where we drove up to the house and there were about three kids in the family and they all ran out and immediately started helping move in. And they were just so excited that we were there and just so excited to see everyone and they were helping move in smaller items. Um, and bringing everyone so much joy. But at one point we turned around and one of the kids had a lampshade on his head that he was wearing as a hat. And he was just sort of like bopping around with his lampshade hat. Um, and it was so funny and it was just a wonderful moment that brought everyone so much joy. And I think um, really reminded everyone again that, you know, kids are just kids and people are people. And it really speaks to the mission of Home Sweet Home that we, um, you know, the whole purpose is just recognizing the dignity in all of our neighbors. Um, and so that's an image that I keep with me when I think of Home Sweet Home. Um, but I'm not here to talk to you today about volunteering or donating household goods, although those are all very critical components of the mission. Um, I'm here, as Betsy said, to talk about being a recurring donor, um, which I absolutely love and I'm so excited to talk about. Um, recurring donations are extremely important for the organization. Um, and so um, if you know nonprofits, sometimes grants or one-time gifts, while all very important, can be a little bit hard to predict from month to month. And so recurring monthly donations really provide a stable um, amount of money coming into the organization that they can really plan on and depend on for doing things like buying gas for the truck um, or, or electricity bills or paying staff or things like that that um, are not always the sexiest things um, that we like to talk about, but definitely keep the mission moving forward. Um, so very important for Home Sweet Home. But I also throw out there that I think recurring donations are a great opportunity for donors. Um, and that's not something that I think we're very conditioned to think about when we're donating because we're supposed to be giving. Um, and it's not about donors. But at the same time, I think of it as a way to actually make a bigger financial contribution to the organization while making it more affordable for me. Um, and so it's a way of actually being able to to contribute more. So if you think about it, um, for me personally, it would be very hard to make a $200 donation at once, but it's definitely very affordable for me to make a $20 donation once a month. Um, and at the end of the year, I've actually donated more um, and a bigger gift at $240. So um, I highly recommend thinking about uh, jumping in as a recurring donor and joining what we call the Furnishing Hope Society. Um, there's a link in your chat uh, over there if you are interested in making a one-time contribution tonight, which is greatly appreciated. Um, and also if you're interested in joining as a recurring donor. Thanks again, Betsy. Have a good night, everyone. I was trying to find that picture, Rachel, because I have it somewhere on here. It's one of the cutest pictures. Um, so just to reiterate and, and kind of build up what Rachel said, um, we... We do have a recurring gift program. And so when we started this mission, we were all volunteer, like Diana said. We were very, very tiny. We had a teeny tiny warehouse. We had one truck. Um, we just had a handful of partner agencies. Um, and we were only able to serve one or two clients a week. Um, now, however, and I almost choked when we looked at this number, um, we are up to such a, a big operation, like a legit service, right? And so we're up to, it costs us $1,400 a day to run this mission. Um, and, and it's so, so well spent. It's so worth every single dime of that money. Um, it takes a lot of financial resources to pull this off and, and it's constantly busting at the seams with furniture. And so 
whenever we think like, oh my gosh, there we might run out of furniture someday. Like what happens if we can't, we can't give this stuff away fast enough. It just tends to like multiply as it's coming in. And so um, all the people, all the resources, all the truck, all the gas, all of that, knowing that there's sustainable income coming in really does help that long-term um, goal there. So I think Janae was gonna post um, a link into the, um, into the chat. Oh, hold on, I don't wanna close Zoom. Into the chat, if you're interested in becoming um, a recurring donor like Rachel, Oh, I meant to bring, we have um, these coffee mugs. And so uh, anybody that joins at the $20 level for a month, we're gonna send you a coffee mug. Um, and just, you know, kind of off our favorite NPR stations, take that and run with it. Um, and then my new picture, if you can see it, is our new sign. So if you've ever tried to find us, um, it's very difficult sometimes, but thanks to Tom Richter, it only took two years, a month, and like two days to get this bad boy up on the corner of Hanley Industrial Court. So um, that's our sign. Uh, and then I think we're gonna head back to um, Diana and Mike. Yep. So. Just say briefly. So um, I know that I talked to a few people today um, that didn't complete their payment but picked up their kit. You could use that link um, that was just posted on the chat if you want to complete that payment for tonight. Yeah. Go right. Oh, I was just going to say, no, we, we had a couple questions. One of the questions was about histamines and rest in red wines. And uh, I'm not a doctor, but we play one at the wine shop. Um, a lot of people complain about histamines um, that you get stuffy when you drink red wine. And, and that is because red wines have more histamines than, than it's in the skin than, than white wines do. Um, and a lot of people react differently. Some people can't drink red wine. Some people can't drink Sauvignon Blanc. So, um, some people don't like rosés because um, it gives them an effect. So um, I did have one customer who said, oh, I just take an antihistamine before I go drinking. I was like, oh, I don't think I can recommend that to to, the, to my customers, um, but it's like a sinus headache. The, the hist any histamine would probably do it, but um, so I don't know all that much about that. It just affects people so differently. We also get a ton of questions about sulfites in wine, and a lot of people will say, "Well, I was in France and I drank all day long and I didn't get a hangover." Well, they do use sulfites there too, and they're a naturally occurring product that, that actually happens when you're fermenting wine. But um, I think some people are truly sensitive to sulfites, but maybe not as many as we think. Um, but I do think it's funny how different people react to different wines, to different, some can drink red, not white, some can drink white, not red. Or, um, yeah, so I think, I actually always recommend, if you think you're struggling, to take it, to keep a journal. Um, Mike was alluding to it, it took me years to really nail down the fact that if I drink a glass of Samuel Monk, I often don't feel great the next morning. Well, that breaks my heart because I love Samuel Monk. But- And she's I, not drinking too much. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, if you feel like you're having some issues, um, maybe keep a journal. There's sulfite drops. I bet one of our guests tonight might be using some of those sulfite drops. I know someone who has some trouble sure. with sulfites. I yeah. Um So yeah, keep a journal if you're not sure. Yeah, there, there are sulfites in all wines. They occur naturally out in the field, but most wines you will read on the back of the, of the label say sulfites added. And that, that, that is to preserve the wine, to um, make it more stable. I asked, um, we, are, we are familiar with the people down at Shaw Met Winery in, in St. Genevieve County, and I asked Hank, why don't you make a, at one point it was a really big thing, sulfites. And I said, why don't you make a sulfite-free wine? He said, Mike, it's just not worth it. I can lose the whole tank in a moment's notice because of the instability of the wine. The sulfites, we put them in and it, and it stabilizes the wine. And, you know, a lot of domestic producers, I, I've asked them the question about non-sulfite wines in, in, uh, in Europe when people go there. And they drink and they don't get headaches. And he said, 
um, they do have, you do have to add sulfites by law to any wines that are imported in the United States. Um, but he said, they're crazy if they're telling you that they don't add sulfites. They just wouldn't risk their business like that. He said, it's the atmosphere. You're in France. <laughs> You're just going to be happier. So, um, so that's, that's the story with sulfites. And then someone was also asking about the fire damage out in, in California. Um, I don't know what's going to be the effect of the current fires out there right now. The past couple of years, you know, we went to Hess uh, last in we were, January. We were I think. in Glen Allen, remember all the damage we saw? Oh when, yeah. When we were out there last time, we were in the Glen Allen area, not the not just the Glen Allen winery. There's some really good wineries there, but. Um, all behind our bed and breakfast was charred on the <clears throat> excuse me on the other side of the river. We saw um, some pretty significant damage that had happened there. Yeah, so, and a lot of the, a lot of the nicer wineries, they just didn't produce the wines uh, that they typically do because of the smoke effect that it had on the grapes. Hess was a, a big example of that. They talked about it. Um, but we, um, we haven't seen a big effect on that at all. Bourbon. bourbon. It's your turn, Betsy. Yeah. So bourbon's fun. It's just, uh, I know uh, a lot of people may be excited about this right now, and some people are like, oh, I'm done. But I hope you stay with us. <laughs> um, so um, bourbon, bourbon is a whiskey. And the definition of a whiskey basically, is that it, it is a distilled spirit from a fermented grain mash that's then aged in wooden barrels. And the grain mash that they talk about is just a combination of grains that you can use to make a whiskey. And they are corn, wheat, barley, and rye. Corn adds sweetness to a whiskey. Wheat adds a softness. Barley adds kind of a broadness or a, a bigger texture to it, and rye adds a spiciness to it. And there are lots of different types of whiskeys. So when people come in and say, I need a whiskey for a gift, or I, you know, I say, what kind of whiskey? Do you want a Scotch whiskey, an Irish whiskey, a Japanese whiskey, a Canadian whiskey, a bourbon, an Indian whiskey? There's just all kinds of different whiskeys. And what they all have in common is that they're distilled from a fermented grain mash and then aged in wood barrels. But there's all different rules for each of the different types of whiskeys that you're going to produce. And bourbon um, has basically, it's got a lot of different rules, but the two most important rules are, number one, that grain mash or that grain mixture that you use has to be at least 51% corn. Corn gives a, a whiskey sweetness. That's what gives bourbon its sweetness is the corn content. Typically, 51% is the minimum, but typically you're looking at two thirds, you know, 65 to 75% corn. And then you add in your barley and your wheat and your rye. Typically, I've seen a few, but typically you never add all four of them. It's usually corn, wheat and barley or corn, rye and barley. The rye is so spicy, it just beats off, beats up. Oh, that's, that was bad. Um, beats up the uh, the effect of the softness of the wheat. So you typically um, have two of, or three of the four. And this one, Woodford Reserve, just to let you know, its mash bill is 72% corn, 10% barley, and 18% rye. So that 18% rye is a bit of a, a hefty rye content, so it gives you a nice spiciness to it. Um, the second of the, of the rules that is most important is that bourbons have to be aged in brand new oak barrels, a brand new American white oak charred barrels. You can only use it once. You put it in the barrel after you distill it, you age it for as many years as you want. It can be four years, it can be six, 12, 23 years old. If it's 23, there's not a whole lot, lot left in the barrel, a lot of evaporation has occurred, occurred over those years. But once you use it, once you bottle the bourbon, you've got this barrel and you can't use it again to make bourbon. 
what they typically do with it is they break it down, ship it off to Scotland or Ireland or Canada in order to, for them to age their whiskeys in it. Their type of whiskey with the formulas that they use, they can't stand that brand new oak barrel. Remember the, the big old pours that the oak barrels have in America? That whiskey just sinks in there and it's just too powerful for the whiskeys that they're producing, but it's perfect for a bourbon. They often nowadays send them to or sell them or give them to their next door neighbors, um, like Stroud Water in Maine. They give them to their next door neighbors who are, or um, just, uh, I'm sorry, breweries, breweries. And, um, and they make them, they use them to make their barrel aged, bur um, bourbon aged stouts and porters and things like that. They can cut them in half and use them as planters if they want, but they can't use them again to make another bourbon. We have a great bourbon called Michter's and they use their used barrels. They put distillate in their used barrels and they call that product an American whiskey. They can't call it bourbon. Um, the, the, the third thing that people would think is a rule that is not correct is that bourbon needs to be made in Kentucky. And that's incorrect. Um, Kentucky does make the majority of the, of the bourbons in the United States. But bourbon is an American product, declared so by the U.S. Congress in 1964, and you can make it in any state in the Union. When I started doing bourbon classes, I don't know, five years ago, time flies, maybe <laughs> seven years 15 ago. 15 years yeah, ago, whatever. You know, there were 16 states in America that were making bourbon. Missouri was one of them at the time. And now all 50 states produce bourbon. If, if you are in another country and you make a whiskey, exactly the way you have to to make a bourbon, you can't import it or export it, I should say, into the United States and put bourbon on the label. The, the government won't allow it. It has to be made in America to put bourbon on the label. Um, what are you saying? I was gonna say, I, Mike likes his, what you call me, just right in the glass, maybe a little chilled. I always like mine with an ice cube. So I don't know how you've been drinking yours, but I always put an ice cube in mine. And hopefully you put them in the, in the refrigerator. I like a little chill on my whiskeys. It softens it just like it does the chill softens a red wine. You know, the alcohol doesn't hit you as hard, I think. Um, we sell these big ice cubes, which are really cool, and they melt very slowly. The reason we, people don't like putting ice cubes in their, in their whiskey is because it continues to melt and continues to change the flavor of the whiskey or bourbon. Um, some people like that. If you haven't eaten your nuts yet, this would be a great time. They go really well with the bourbon. Maybe you have some left, try it with the bourbon with those cherries would be nice too. Have you tried the jam on with the, the cheese? cheese. Oh, Mike, so good. Mike keeps eating the jam and the cheese. Yeah. You good um, so I was gonna talk a little bit about Woodford Reserve. Uh, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, distillery. If you ever go to Kentucky, we went one, once with friends and we kind of goofed um, that they set us up on tours. It's not like Napa Valley. If you go to Napa Valley and you go to wineries, it's like boom, 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 all the way up Highway 29. But we, it's quite, quite a drive from distillery to distillery. And we went to Woodford and it's just beautiful. We didn't have time for a uh, tour, but we went for lunch and the people were so nice there. They, the waitress started talking to us, where are you from, what are you doing here, where are you staying, all this stuff, and we told them we were, about, we were uh, with Grapevine Wines, and she said, oh, did you do the tour? And I said, no. She said, um, I, you know, I said, we didn't have time. She said, get your camera, let's go. So she took me, ran me around while the other tours were going on, and we got the, the picture, you know, the mash tanks um, at the, um, at the stills, which is really cool. And that's in the barrel room, which is really a neat place. But the cool thing about Woodford Reserve, so typically bourbon is distilled twice and they use a column still, which is a continuous still. A very efficient, very inexpensive way to make whiskey versus like Scotland where they use pot stills. These copper stills, very much of a batch, batch process. You gotta clean it out after you make a batch start the whole process over. And in Scotland, 
They typically double distill as well, but in some parts they triple distill. In Ireland, they always seem to triple distill. And the more often you distill, the smoother it gets because they keep taking the center cut and, um, and making it better and better. What's really unique about Woodford Reserve is that they triple distill. Not only do they triple distill, but they use copper stills. And one of the pictures that I'm in that my kids accuse me of being photoshopped in has me in front of the three stills at Woodford. And it's a beautiful picture <laughs> uh, with me in it. Uh, but, uh, but it's got Woodford in the background and it's really a unique way to make bourbon here in the United States. We're ready. All right, I think we're ready to turn it back over. Awesome. You said Thank I could you. talk and talk and talk. I know, I know, but I, yeah. well, we've talked yeah. plenty. I think we're about ready to return it. All right, so I know we have about 10 minutes left, so we, we won't try to steal your entire evening. Um, but wanted to thank Mike and Diana for walking us through those. I know the, the Woodford is really good. My board chair may have given me a bottle recently. Um, so <laughs> we've got that in the office if you ever want to come and visit. Um, the reason that we're all really here tonight, um, besides the amazing food and the drink, um, is to learn a little bit more about this great mission and learn about how we can help others in our community and celebrate all that's happened in the last five years. Uh, so a few people have asked um, a few things about how many clients we serve and what this looks like during COVID. So this is, um, I'm just gonna give folks a little bit of an update. Um, we, back in March, you know, before March 15th, um, we were running two trucks. We always have two team members on each truck. Um, we had one case manager. Um, and some other office staff that help facilitate donations and um, do stuff in the office. And we were serving, and Sean, tell me if I'm wrong, we were serving about 24 clients a week at that point. Um, and it was kind of working like clockwork. We were in a really good rhythm. And we um, had just secured the funding for a third truck when COVID hit. Um, and so we shut down from roughly March 15th or 17th until June 1st. Um, again, because of contributions and the support of our volunteers and our donors, we were able to, to continue to pay the staff and make sure that they were supported during this time. Um, it was, you know, if you work part-time, you don't have a lot of resources to kind of ride out eight or 10 weeks. And so for us to be able to do that for our staff meant a lot to them. Um, when we restarted, of course, it all looked different. Of course, you know, we're wearing face masks and we're trying to stay as far apart as possible. And it's really hard to run a warehouse, to carry a couch, to do some of the work that we're doing without getting, you know, semi-close to each other. Um, but the staff has done an amazing job at trying to be as safe as we possibly can. But what it does mean is that our mission is slower in order to keep our staff safe and to keep our clients safe. So our clients um, and our families that we work with often don't have health care. Right? They, they don't have a lot of resources. They might have a lot of underlying health conditions. And so for us to take the chance to possibly get them sick is something we take really seriously. So we, we operate really slowly right now. Um, well, we did until this week. Um, so for the most part, uh, three days a week, we would deliver furniture in the morning um, with each truck. The movers would come back. They would change their whole, their, their outfit, right? They would take their, their shirt off and they would take their mask off and they would change their clothes to avoid any potential, you know, coronavirus sticking. We don't know exactly how it works. So we're trying to take as many precautions as possible. And they'd change and they'd go back out and do a second delivery um, later that day, of course, with the hand washing and all of that jazz. But it meant that we were maybe only serving 10 to 12 clients um, a week as opposed to the 24. The other thing that looked really different, which I know broke everybody's heart but everyone I mean it was just the way that we had to do it was we could no longer have clients come and shop and pick out their things so in the video you saw the clients getting to look at the items and hold them and you know like sit in a chair and kind of feel it out with COVID that didn't make sense anymore we could not ask our clients to get on a bus full of people to come down to the warehouse full of people and then to ride a bus back 
And so um, what we did is our staff worked really hard to think of an online shopping process for them. Um, and it, again, it takes a long time, but we take pictures of most of the pieces of furniture and household items. So lamps, wall art, couches, kitchen tables, I feel like something else. I feel like we keep adding to the list. Uh, chairs, they all get pictures. They get put onto a Google Drive. And then um, our case manager does a lot of texting back and forth and we'll send them the link and walk through. So the clients still get to that option to have the dignity to pick out their own furniture, even though it's done differently. And we really worried on that this would impact our service. Um, but, but the response has actually been really, really amazing. You know, we don't have a lot of time. We don't feel like going out in public right now. Our clients are the same way, right? So they don't want to necessarily come down. So they really appreciate getting, getting a link, getting something on their phone. They spend a lot of time with that case manager to walk through all those items. So again, that part takes a lot longer too. Um, because of that taking longer, we are actually, we're able to secure some additional COVID funding from St. Louis County CARES funds um, and hire an additional case manager. So that allows us to then pick up that pace. But then we were like, okay, well, we now we have potentially three trucks, which we had not purchased yet, that CARES funding actually allowed us to offset some other costs so we could purchase truck four. So now back from March, we had two trucks. All of a sudden the other day we end up with being able to purchase two more trucks. So now we're at four. Um, the other piece that's really important for really making all this happen is um, if you've ever been in our warehouse or volunteered, you probably have met Sean. Sean was our case manager, um, had been, had started as a mover and he's on here he's now with uh, his partner, Lindsay. So give him a shout out because Sean is probably more dedicated to this mission than I am. And so we made him an operations director and I think that's the title, I always mess it up. But essentially Sean is now responsible for making sure all the deliveries happen, for making sure that all the incoming furniture gets taken care of and um, making sure that our warehouse runs smoothly. And, and it's been a transition for everybody because we've had to hire new staff, we have new case managers, we have um, a new admin, Julie, who's also on here. Um, so there's a lot of new staff, four trucks, and we just started running those trucks this week. Um, so it's been really amazing. The other piece, real fast, that's really made four trucks possible is um, one of our board members, Michelle, who is on here, had this genius idea to get us a UV light. Um, and so we now actually have five trucks because that fifth truck is actually just a box on wheels. Um, and we put all the furniture in that. So one of the pieces of coronavirus was that we had to kind of put all the furniture aside and quarantine it um, for almost a week. So again, that slowed us down. So this UV light box, all the donated furniture goes in that immediately now. Uh, we flip that light on, uh, wait two hours, we move that furniture out, it's ready to go to clients just like that. Um, and so thanks to that, COVID-related funding, thanks to all of your donations um, of furniture and, and financial donations, we've been able to really make this process. And Sean and I were just talking this morning. We're like, it's gone so well this week. We're like, let's get, what, do we, what do we miss? Like, did, so do we miss something? Is something going to like drop on us? Uh, but it's it's been really amazing. That dock, if you've been in, in the warehouse in the last few months, it's always really full. Um, the dock is now clear and things are really coming together. And so we're really so proud of all that's been able to happen. So I think that we're going to potentially be able to now serve more than 24 families a week. So the goal is to get up to pass to what we were at COVID. Um, and if we do this well, we'll be able to serve just, just a, a bit more than that 24. Um, and so more than 1,800 clients today, and we're actually looking at adding a few new partner agencies to that list. So some exciting service things that have happened. The other thing which is worth noting is that uh, the United Way had opened up funding um, recently, and so we were one of 28 new organizations that were added to the United Way funding. So um, it is campaign time. If you're familiar or your organization um, typically gives to the United Way, Give because in 2021, for the next three years, um, we will benefit from those donations and those contributions. So we're really excited 
um, not only for the financial support that comes with that, but the legitimacy and the opportunity that that really gives the mission and the work that you all have done. I mean, seriously, we would not have gotten to this point where we could have even applied and been a successful candidate if it had not been all the hours of volunteering, all the work that the board has done to build us up and the contributions to get us there. So that is all you guys and, and Berta who helped us write that grant. Um, the real, real reason we're here, and I'll be brief because we're really running out of, of, of minutes. Um, so Rachel, I'm going back to the whole reason we're here is the clients and the families that we serve. And with COVID, um, we, again, we're doing this all digitally. And so I, Sean and I were talking and I told him, you know, I'm really feeling disconnected um, from the clients, not being able to go and be a part of their, their delivery anymore. And um, so I started calling them. And, and if I'm at the office now at about four in the clock in the afternoon, I try to just call everybody real fast. And I just say like, Hey, this is Betsy. I'm the boss over here at Home Sweet Home. Um, they don't know me, right? And I just, I'm just saying to them, like, I'm just calling to check to see how it went today with your furniture. And everyone has been so overwhelmingly happy. And there has been no complaints. Everyone says, oh, I love my couch. I, I Often I say, what's your favorite thing? And the response is everything. Like, everything's my favorite, right? Um, so that's been really good to just be able to touch base that same day. And I always ask, like, what could we do better? And, and hopefully someday somebody will give us something really good to work with. But right now it seems to be working really, really well. And we're getting that feedback that same day. Um, but a very quick client story. And I have a lot, but the, one of them that I really like, and it actually ties into what Rachel was telling about the story with the kid and the lampshade on his head, because that's one of my favorite stories. But... Uh, the, the other part of that is um, that kid's mom was like nine months pregnant, right? She's so pregnant. Um, and if I recall correctly, the, the kids had mattresses, but um, Rich, you, Daniels, you were there that day and Mike Fisher. Um, the kids had mattresses, but they weren't, uh, uh, Chris Reinhardt, I think if you're here, you were there that day too. They weren't mattresses you and I would want our kids to be sleeping on. So when she, but we typically, if they have mattresses, we try not to bring them more, right? Like we have limited resources. So when we get there, she said, well, my kids actually have mattresses, but I'd really like new ones for them. And I said, well, let's take a look at them, right? Oh, I took all I had to just not break down in front of her because they weren't anything that you or I would, would want our kids to be sleeping on. And I said, absolutely, we will take care of this. The volunteers, I think Rachel and Rich were part of this. They took, picked them up, not something they necessarily wanted to do, just took them back to the dumpster, right? Got rid of them. The, the mom, for, for some reason, we had a king size mattress. Don't usually take those, don't usually want them because the clients usually can't fit them in their space. But we knew she had a space big enough. And so we brought her, this pregnant woman, the, this biggest brand new king size mattress from Weekends Only. And um, putting everything in there, I think her house also had smoke detectors that weren't working and the volunteers, some of them went out to go get batteries for the smoke detectors. So that just shows you the quality of our volunteers. Um, and at some point I can't find the mom and she's in the closet and she's crying because she's so overwhelmed, right? So the whole day is just... <laughs> just really overwhelming for, for everybody. I think those kids also ended up with bikes somehow from another organization. Anyway, um, but what was really funny is, like, you know, they, we take the picture and we get everything set up and the kids now have new mattresses on their, on their bunk beds and sheets and they're so excited. And we leave and I had called the case manager on Monday. We always follow up with the case managers the next day to make sure it went okay. And um, said, just wanted to check in how did it go? And she goes, so it was a Saturday, so this would have been a Monday. And she goes, oh my gosh, she was so excited. She went into labor that same day. And I said, and if you know me, this is funny. If you don't know me, it might seem brass. But the first thing out of my mouth was, oh my God, tell me she didn't give birth on her new bed. <laughs> <laughs> it was this brand new king size bed. But I, I laughed and she laughed and then I said, wait, wait, she's, she's, everybody's good, right? And she's like, yes, every mom is healthy, baby is happy. 
Um, and the kids were really excited to have, I don't remember if it was a boy or a girl, but um, that is one story that always sticks with me. Um, all that leads us back to our board president. Real quick, I just want to say thank you to Mike, Bob, Diana at Grapevines. Thank you to our board and our staff and our sponsors, Ted Luck Brugman and Castle Contracting. And Christy, if you are there, unmute yourself. Let's see if you can see me. Oh, yeah, you're in the dark. We're sitting outside on this lovely evening and enjoying some socially distanced um, socializing. Uh, thank you so much, Mike and Diana, for putting this together for us. What a wonderful evening. My gosh, this is amazing. Um, we very much enjoyed it. And the, the bourbon was a good touch for Betsy and for myself. So thank you so much. Um, I want to just take a moment and say thank you to all the people that made this event possible because this took a lot of work behind the scenes. And Mike and Diana, I mean, Oh my gosh, we owe you like a, I don't know, European vacation or something after this to go taste some more wine. Um, you guys have just really put so much work into this and it was wonderful. Um, Rachel and Janae, thank you for making all the details work. We so appreciate you. Um, Connie Krenigy, if you're on, oh my gosh, like what a great idea. Um, Mike Fisher, thank you for connecting all the dots and helping us make this all happen. And Betsy, um, just for being your amazing self and always pulling everything together and um, always stepping up in every in every single way. I did also want to thank our sponsors again, Tadlock Brugman and Castle Contracting. Um, and then I wanted to quickly introduce you to our incoming president. So my term is up at the end of this year. Um, and we are just so lucky to have Mike Fisher coming on board as our incoming president. He's been a volunteer with the organization for quite some time and his passion and his care for our people is absolutely incredible. Um, and I think he really represents everything that's great about this organization. And every time he talks, he makes me cry. So now that you guys are all drunk, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike and let him make you cry. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Incredible shoes to fill. When Christy started as the board president, we had one truck and we were in a warehouse in Locust Street that was about 3,000 square feet. And now we're in 10,000 foot square feet warehouse and we have four trucks. So your leadership has really been instrumental for us. Thank you, Mike. And so I have two quick stories. I know this has gone over time, but I can't help myself not tell these two stories. You saw on the video, the young child jumping up and down on the bed. I've seen that live. In my first year, I've been, I've been delivering furniture, volunteering for about five years before we even had a warehouse. And we delivered to a family where they had three kids and, and went up into the bedroom and they had sleeping bags because that's all they had. They didn't have a bed. We delivered the three beds and set them up, and his kids were jumping up and down on them with big smiles on their face. And I came to the realization that Home Sweet Home is not about furniture. It's about changing lives. And um, so another quick story is John Jennings, who's on the, 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 the wine tasting tonight, um, said that his, before he came to, to uh, volunteer to deliver furniture, his daughter, he's having breakfast with his daughter, and his daughter said, why are you going to Home Sweet Home again? When are you going to stop? When are you going to be done? And he said, we'll be done when every kid who needs a bed has one. So that's what drives us for every kid to have a bed who needs one in St. Louis. And uh, your, your donations can help us do that every day, and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, for, for those, if you're interested in making an additional donation to help us um, with all the things that we have to do in 2021, uh, Janae just posted um, a link for that. It's Home Sweet Home virtual white night. It's the same link you use to register. Um, your, your donation will go far and you'll make a giant impact and be part of this amazing family of people. So thank you for everybody. Mike and Diana, did you want to um, lead us out or answer any other questions that came in? Uh, the only thing I think we've said that uh, if you mention Home Sweet Home tomorrow when you call us to place an order, 10% of wine, food, and accessories will go back to Home Sweet Home. So if you loved any of those wines or those foods, give us a call tomorrow. But that's any wine. Any wine, that's any true. food, any accessories. Right. Yeah. And um, so you can email us at 
It's kind of long. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to type it into the comments too. There you go. Info at grapevinewinesandspirits.com. That'll be good. Thank you. But yeah, we, it was we, great we, meeting we everyone. A, we had a great time. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everybody so much. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us or Mike and Diana, and we love seeing everybody. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Thanks, everyone. This is amazing. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Did I'm hitting you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was, yeah. okay. it was fun. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, okay. 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 Well, Very I will. Nice. Vander plumes. I mean, so I can't. Are the Vander plumes here? Yeah. I just saw them, I think. Yep. We are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, really? I know.